YouTube. It's all on YouTube. Yeah. Thank you, Beverly. I'm always like so nervous when people introduce me because I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? Who am I? I forgot. Um, but I recognized most of those things because I recently updated my CV. So that's great. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here to hear me talk. So let's get started. Humans are weird. I think that's a good place to start this. Um, in anthropology, we often talk about what makes humans as a species different or unique. And a lot of times when we have this discussion of human uniqueness, we focus on traits like bipedalism, our larger brain, maybe tool making. But there's one trait uh, that I want to focus on, and that's our alleged hairlessness. Humans are sometimes referred to as naked apes, but while a lack of body fur does make us stand out compared to other living apes, it really isn't that unique among mammals. Most mammals are hairy, yes, but there are naked mammals in the sea, there are naked mammals underground, and there are naked mammals above ground on the savannah. I would argue that really what makes us weird is the fact that we are the only weirdos who could not commit to the bit of either being naked or furry. So the specific trait that I find um, of interest is scalp hair. So scalp hair is pretty variable. Um, there is a huge range of variation in its morphology from straight to super tightly curled. And with it being such a variable, weird, and fascinating phenotype, my question is, why do we know so little? And I would say that the issues have to do with um, a lack of phenotyping methods that are good enough, the populations of interest, and the evolutionary hypotheses that we've used to try and understand this trait. So first, phenotyping methods for hair morphology, what are they? So for some reason, this thing is not playing nice with me. Wow. Who's this going to? Okay, well, you know what? Uh, Microsoft is a hater. You guys are just gonna roll with it. So the way that we think about people's hair is usually in terms of these categories of straight, wavy, or curly. Now, when it comes to studies that have tried to find genetic associations with hair morphology, they've used these categories. Some of them have diversified into frizzy, added as a category, okay, we're getting diverse. It's Black History Month. Some of them have split slightly wavy from wavy and others yet have split curls into big curls and small curls. But it does not matter how many categories you have, how many words you use, this is all still a subjective assessment. To properly phenotype uh, hair, we need to consider the levels of morphology. So we could be interested in the entire scalp, which is usually what we're talking about when we're describing that texture. But you can also think about the individual hair fiber. 
You can go even further than that and look at the microstructure. And you can go even further and look at the molecular structure. For me, the research that I've done focuses on the level of the individual hair fiber, where I look at cross-section and curvature. So when it comes to hair curvature, it's very simply the range from straight to tightly curled. And the way it's defined is you fit a circle to the curve of the hair. And the smaller the circle is, the smaller the radius. Um, and basically, what you have is then increased curvature, which is the inverse of the radius. When it comes to cross sections, you can think about eccentricity, which is basically the deviation from how perfectly round it is. But you can also think about the cross sectional area. So fun tip, in case you think these things are fun tips. Uh, whenever people are talking about coarse versus fine hair, that's a pet peeve of mine. Um, really what they mean is how thick someone's individual hair fiber is. And coarse doesn't really sound cute. Because imagine if we were talking about skinny hair, like that wouldn't make you feel good. So there you go. No more fine and coarse, only cross-sectional area. So if classifying is so bad, then why aren't more people measuring? Well, it turns out that the methods are pretty time consuming and labor intensive. Um, when it comes to cross sections, you need to slice the hair shaft and use a microscope to look at its cross section. That is something that we have been technologically capable of doing since the 19th century, which is why you have these really fun old papers describing cross sectional differences in different races of man. Um, now, one thing that I like a lot about cross-section is because we've had this method of measuring it, anyone who really wanted to put the time in really could do it. And there is a gene that we learned about by doing genetic associations with measurements of cross-section. So this is one of my favorite papers. It is an association between ectodysplacin uh, A receptor gene, which is associated with hair thickness. So in East Asian populations, we found that there is selection for a certain variant that makes hair thicker. Um, now, many eons ago when I was just starting out my PhD, I figured that, well, if I'm trying to measure this trait and these people did it and did a genetic association, I should probably email them. Um, so I did, and I completely forgot about it um, until nine months later, Nine whole months later, I got an email from Akihiro Fujimoto, who was the lead of that paper. So the lesson here is it's never too late to reply to that email, so go through your inboxes. Akihiro very kindly dug up from his archives a PowerPoint slide that gave a step-by-step -step of the methods that they used to um, do the cross sections. So on the top row, you can see that the process is um, with uh, paraffin. So that's a soft embedding medium, basically a wax. And this is how they prep their samples. And on the bottom, you see what the process looked like with epoxy. So basically, they learned that when they were using um, paraffin wax, it, the hair moved a lot. And it was very annoying. You can kind of see that on the last picture. Um, but doing epoxy is something that is very, very time consuming. So kind of talking through these problems, resin can take like 24 hours to dry or cure once you have uh, poured it somewhere. So if you're embedding curly hairs especially, that's super annoying because they won't lie down straight and you need them to lie down straight to get a clean cross section. I just want you to think for a second about how finicky it is to get little bits of hair into something that small and then please clap. Um, it really, really sucks but it made me understand why people weren't doing this. Um, and you know, asking um, Akihiro about this, he said, yeah, curly hair is really hard. Good thing that East Asians don't have a lot of curly hair. So thoughts and prayers with your um, African diaspora samples. But I did ultimately come up with a solution. So um, here what you can see is a low melt point plastic called polycaprolactone, which we would heat up and then just directly embed the hair. If you push the hair into it with the little tweezers, it's immediately encased. And another pro is that the material is so soft that you can just cut it with a razor as opposed to using 
power tools, which is what I had to do when I was working with uh, resin or diamond tipped microtomes, which are very expensive. Now, when it comes to curvature, unlike cross-sectional morphology, it doesn't really have a very long history of being measured. The oldest uh, mention I could find of quantifying hair curvature was from 1973 when Daniel Herdy, an undergraduate at Harvard at the time, published a study of quantitative hair form variation in seven populations. So he described a new way of measuring curvature and there were, there were some issues. Like this was absolutely innovative and a great first step, but there are some problems with measuring curvature in hair. The first being it's a three-dimensional thing and curvature is a two-dimensional feature really. So you'd have to flatten it. Herdy's solution was to flatten the hair between two microscope slides and then measure the curves that way. Then what he would do is he would take a transparency with arcs of different sizes and then compare the curves on the hair. Um, as you can imagine, this is a very time consuming. I have replicated it. Um, this is something that you have to keep a lot of notes with and there's a lot of subjectivity involved because where does one curve start? Where does a curve end? It's all pretty subjective, but it gives us at least like a basis of something to do. So I came up with some solutions. So first of all, I decided I was gonna solve the three-dimensional to two-dimensional issue by cutting the hairs so small that they only curved in a single dimension, um, or two dimensions, I guess. Then that also allowed us to transfer the hairs to tubes and wash them because, and this is something that we talked about in the class previously, you have to wash hair because we do so much to our hair and that can change its structure. So if we're operationalizing curvature as the intrinsic curve of the individual fiber, you wanna make sure that nothing is influencing that as best as you can. And then ultimately we decant it into a pre-tree dish in isopropanol and take images of it. So that gives us a bunch of photos of cross sections and curvature, but then you still need to actually measure it. So I started out with ImageJ. Anyone ever use ImageJ here? Oof, okay, that's my people. You guys know the struggle. It's a lot of manual work. Um, I spent a lot of the last year of undergrad drawing circles on a computer. And then I made a bunch of undergrads do it <laughs> during my PhD so we could validate the new uh, metrics. But that means that even with all of these solutions, you have to do a lot of image analysis work on the computer. So if my goal is to create methods that make life easier, this is something I had to overcome. So I went ahead and developed an open source Python program called Fibermorph. And it automates this entire process from image to final measurements for cross sections and curvature. I spent seven years of my life doing this and I am blasting through it in one slide. Um, that, that's just the nature of research. Now, with these methods, we don't solve all of our problems because we have to start thinking about who we are measuring these traits in. So if we go through what populations people have looked at hair um, texture in, we find that they're mostly Europeans um, with some East and Southeast Asians. And the po other populations that have been looked at, if we're talking about the US and Australian samples, they in one way or another will articulate that these are people of European ancestry. So um, there is this one other study that came out in 2016 on a sample called the Candela cohort, which is a range of different South American populations. Um, and they had hair as one of the traits that they did genetic associations on. So I got really excited because there's a lot of admixture in Latin America. So even though we may not have anything from the entire African continent, I was like, well, maybe there's some representation. Um, but unfortunately, it's not quite what I had hoped for. And part of the issue was their phenotyping methods, which were as follows. Hair was scored as one straight, two wavy, three curly, four frizzy. They put numbers on it, but that doesn't make it quantitative. Um, and 
because the category of frizzy was so racialized, um, I was wondering, well, what did they do with it? Well, they said, well, few individuals were scored as having frizzy hair. And these individuals were excluded from the hair-shaped GWAS. So, wow, our one chance to include African ancestry and we're just Now, that was a little suspicious to me because 2.4%, uh, across all of Latin America, they couldn't have had a lot of African ancestry in their sample, and I was right, they didn't have a lot of African ancestry. So here is an admixture plot of the different populations that were in that sample, um, and the green component is indigenous American ancestry, blue is European ancestry, and then the orange is African ancestry. Um, you know, Brazil is a surprise. But this just goes to show that just because you have samples from a certain named population doesn't mean it's necessarily well represented, especially if it's a heterogeneous population. So really making sure you include various populations is something that is going to be difficult for many reasons. And we can talk a little bit more about this if anyone's interested at the end. But let's go back to frizzy hair. What is frizzy hair even? Now, the best way to understand this descriptor as it's most widely used is a racialized category referring to tightly curled hair of the kind that is considered to only naturally occur in African populations or others racialized as black. And you see that here in how people are using the descriptions of hair. So categories one and two define straight hair, type three reflects wavy hair, Types four and five refer to curly hair typical for people of European ancestry. Now that curly hair typical for people of European ancestry is doing a lot of work. And you must ask yourself, why would you define a trait that can only occur in a particular population? This seems a little circular. That seems a little circular. Seems like a poorly defined trait. Um, but this is referring to a study that L'Oreal did where they measured a bunch of different aspects of hair to come up with a classification system, which don't ask me why it made sense to them to measure a bunch of stuff to just then categorize it. Like, you have a measure, that's great. Now they came up with eight different um, categories based off of what I can only describe as vibes. And the most atrocious part of all of this is they start out their article saying, okay, we want people to stop using race and ethnicity to describe hair texture, we want them to use like the hair form to describe it. So we're gonna do all of this work and then people see these categories. They're not gonna measure all the different aspects of hair that L'Oreal measured, no. They're gonna do what that little um, sentence does and it's look at these and say, mm, I know where I can group people into. Pictures, man. Like having pictures in science articles apparently is, is, is not a good idea because people are just gonna use it for racial categorization. But anyway, one thing that we can do to move past this is to start thinking about admixed populations. A lot of the typologies that we've seen, they rely on this idea of racial purity in some way. Because after all, how can you distinguish European curly hair from African frizzy hair if you don't look at Europeans and Africans as fundamentally different? So admixed populations are a great way to demonstrate the limitation of racial taxonomies. And it's a good way to show how complex traits um, like skin color and hair morphology um, can evolve and manifest in different populations. So something that's been done a lot is research on skin color. Now, if you're doing admixture research, what you're looking for in a continuous trait is two populations where the range of the trait is almost non-overlapping. Like that's your, your best scenario. Because then when you have a uh, admixed population with those two ancestries, they'll span the full range of that trait. And what you will have is an association of that trait with ancestry. So here is an example of how it's been done with skin color where on the X axis you see the proportion of African ancestry and on the Y axis um, you see melanin index, just from light to dark. Now, the way that you should interpret this is not simply as the more African you are, the darker your skin will be, but it's like to understand what the logic is. What you're trying to do with an admixture analysis like this is to 
say, okay, we know you have ancestors from groups that were isolated from each other for a long time. And because they were isolated, they accumulated genetic patterns in different dire directions. So you can distinguish them based off of those genetic patterns. And what you're then doing by assigning ancestry to uh, different locations of the genome is saying, who did you inherit this from? What ancestor did this segment of your genome come from? And what you end up seeing in complex traits is that the more segments of your genome that come from your African ancestry, the more likely it is that some of those segments also carry information about skin pigmentation and how much melanin you should produce. So that's why you have that association. Um, okay, so if you have two populations where there's complete overlap in the trait, you wouldn't expect to see something like this at all. So I tried to look at this and I had a sample where I had curvature, skin reflectance, and cross sections. So skin reflectance is skin pigmentation measured by a reflectance spectrophotometer. And that was as a control trait. So like I just showed you, you can look at correlations between ancestry and melanin index, and that's been well established. And we know what genes are respond. We know many of the genes that are involved in skin pigmentation. So the sample I looked at was uh, starting off with 4,000 samples. And I was primarily interested in people who had African and European ancestry. And then I filtered out for individuals who had at least 10% African ancestry. And then I was limited, of course, by the ones that we had a hair sample from. So the grand total came to 193 samples, which is not great, but it's not nothing. So the first thing I wanted to do was to check if we would see the same correlation with ancestry in my sample that had been demonstrated in other African European samples with skin pigmentation. And yes, also in my sample, we saw that people with more African ancestry had higher melanin index. Now, what I was really interested in is can we replicate this with hair? So my reasoning was, well, hair is probably also a complex trait. It's definitely continuous. Um, and maybe if we see the same patterns as we do in skin color, maybe we'll have just as much success in identifying genes that influence hair morphology um, as we have had with identifying genes that influence skin pigmentation. And yes, it was a nice similar line, significant. We see a correlation between ancestry and hair curvature. So that doesn't prove anything other than maybe we're onto something here. And it supports the idea that we were missing a lot by homogenizing frizzy hair, right? You could not ever see this correlation if you were using these categories. And to emphasize that, I'll show you what it would look like. Here is that same scatter plot that you saw, except this time I colored it by objective cutoff points for different hair textures. So if we take some cutoff point for what has been defined as very curly hair, that is all of the variation that is collapsed within frizzy. Um, now, that is me being generous because people are not objectively measuring hair curvature most of the time for their categorizations. They're asking people to self-report their trait. And this is what it looks like when people do that. So here you have on the x-axis the objectively measured curvature of that individual's hair. And then we have their self-reported hair type. Now, I am um, excited to announce that I think we can all agree what is straight hair. That's beautiful. That is what we see here. Like we, we can get on board about what kind of hair is straight. We go to wavy. Okay, uh, there are some people who have hair that might be curlier than what we define as, or that many people define as wavy. And then we see curly and very curly. And what is curly for one person might be very curly for another and vice versa. Now, what I'm not going into here but I do have data on if anyone is interested in researching this, is looking at how this correlates with people's um, ethnic and racial identity and their ancestry. Because you can imagine that maybe relative to other people who you consider to be like you, your hair is much curlier. And therefore, you say it's very curly. 
or vice versa. Your hair is practically wavy compared to some of the people that you're around. Now, speaking of hair and racialization, I know I said that there isn't a lot of research on hair, um, but there is. It's just not in biological anthropology. Um, a lot of it is in forensics and in dermatology. So these are from two textbooks. Um, the, on the right is a uh, forensic textbook. On the left is a dermatology textbook or article. I'm not sure. I think textbook. Um, in forensics, one of the things that they used to do, I say used to, I think they still do, but that's a separate story, is um, a hair a fiber analyst, one of the things that they have to do is identify fibers from a particular crime scene. And you have to identify what that fiber is. And if it's a hair fiber from a human, then you want to assign it its racial origin. So this textbook um, excerpt describes what the characteristics are of different races and their hair. Now, on the dermatology side, there is a lot of stuff that is quite similar. Something that we see here is that People whose biological race is black have flat cross sections and their hair is frizzy. Um, orientals are so similar and invariable that it suffices to have only one of them to show that their hair is round and completely straight. And Europeans, white people, are uniquely variable in having a range of different hair textures and hair colors. So I'm being a little flippant, but that just goes to show what the issues are with the way that we define these phenotypes by subjective descriptive words instead of actually measuring anything. Um, now, there's something I want to point out here. That correlation that we have, or it's not even a correlation here, but that association that we have here of round and straight and flat and frizzy or tightly curled is something that has driven like this ongoing mythology that cross-sectional shape is what dictates hair morphology. And I have seen a lot of like internet blog posts as well like say this. And you know, I can see where it comes from. It's like you see East Asians who have straight hair and they have round cross sections. You see people who are of African ancestry, have flat cross sections and really curly hair. You can see how the logic goes of like, oh, those two things must be associated. But in those cases, you're not able to discern if those are just traits that are co-occurring and not necessarily intrinsically linked to each other. What's nice is the sample that I had allows us to, um, no pun intended, disentangle those two traits because if there is an intrinsic physical link between the cross-sectional shape of a hair fiber and its curvature, we should see that in an admixed population too. So here on the x-axis you have eccentricity, so from round to flat, and then curvature on the y-axis from straight to tightly curled, and you know, okay, it's, you know, it's kind of a correlation, we see that. But once you correct for ancestry, that correlation goes away. And this is just an opportunity for me to make the point of racializing human variation happens when we have qualitative categories and composite phenotypes, so multiple traits that we're looking at together as one phenotype. That is something that happens a lot because that is how racial categories are constructed. It's basically this suite of traits of this is how you become this specimen or that specimen. Now, this is why the methods are really important because they allow us to see how those things are related. The hair example might have felt a little bit, you know, okay, sure, who cares? But maybe driving it home with something that's more familiar will help it make sense. Here you have a correlation with melanin index on the x-axis and curvature on the y-axis. So what are we seeing? We are seeing that skin color is correlated with hair curl. So the darker your skin is, the curlier your hair is. Of course, right? That makes sense. Well, not really. We know that there's no reason to expect that skin pigmentation influences your hair morphology. But what you're seeing is that ancestry from an African population is correlated with both of these traits. So when you correct for ancestry, 
you see that that goes away. And that's kind of what you want to be thinking about when you are looking at traits and considering whether they should even be considered a singular trait. But moving beyond correlations for a second, previous studies have looked at hair morphology, um, by which I mean previous genetic studies. And they've found associations, even though the populations I'm interested in aren't represented, that doesn't mean that this is not useful. There are genes that might be responsible and SNPs, um, single nucleotide poly polymorphisms that might be the same across populations. So I looked in my sample, my cute little humble 193 individuals, and I managed to replicate 24 previously reported SNPs. You may not know this is really impressive in a sample of 193 people. So to give you an example of what we were able to replicate, this is a SNP that we found on chromosome 20 where a previously reported study said that the C allele was associated with curlier hair, and in our study, the C allele was associated with higher hair curvature. So that's fantastic. That's exciting, because that means we not only replicated the locus, the SNP uh, that was associated with that trait, but we replicated the direction. So it's the small wins, honestly. You kind of want to accumulate this, this body of knowledge that you're doing the right thing. And honestly, this is me after, what, 10 years saying, was it worth all of that time actually measuring this trait? And this is showing like, well, maybe it was. Maybe you are doing something that wasn't doable before with the lack of methods. Now, another interesting thing that we would want to see if we were really um, discovering genetic associations that were truly associated with hair morphology is certain patterns in how the alleles that are associated with our trait are distributed in the world. So here we have that SNP that I was talking about and the two alleles. You have the C allele that is mostly represented across African populations. And you have the T allele that is represented across Eurasia and even fixed in some populations. So the C allele is associated with curlier hair. This is exactly what we would expect, right? I had a European African sample where I was hypothesizing that whatever the variant is that Africans have will be associated with curlier hair. So this is actually not really impressive. It could also just show that it's the spurious correlation and wow, I just picked up African ancestry. But the thing that popped out as really supporting that we had actually done something useful is what the allele frequency was in Melanesians. So for those of you who are not entirely familiar with what Melanesians look like, they too have very dark skin, but more importantly for my trait, very curly hair. And they do not have African ancestry. They are just as distantly related to Africans as Europeans and Asians. So if you're looking for some uh, functional evidence, some evidence that the gene you're looking at actually affects the function of the trait, that you're interested in, you want to know whether it works across populations, which is what we're showing here. Now that we've discussed the issues with phenotyping and populations included or excluded from genetic studies, I just want to briefly focus on the evolutionary hypotheses relating to human scalp hair. You may be surprised to hear that there are not that many articles on the evolution of human scalp hair. Uh, when it comes to human uniqueness and hair, what's mostly been focused on is this idea that humans are special because we don't have fur, we have hair instead. And in particular, that human hair is special because it grows long. Now, this article was cited by Nicholas Don in his book, which is never a good sign, um, where he asks, when did you last see a chimpanzee getting a haircut? Human head hair differs from that of apes in that it never stops growing. First of all, for the average person, I think we could just say, when was the last time you saw a chimp? That's not something people regularly do. But also, head hair does not grow forever. Hair doesn't grow forever. Hair grows cyclically, and it has a growth cycle, a resting cycle, and a phase in which it uh, falls out. So the difference between human head hair and other hair on our body is just how long that whole cycle is. With head hair, hair can grow anywhere up to seven or 10 years in that phase, but it's not forever. 
So other people responded to um, this article and basically it was a really fun exchange of pet theories where some people said that it's mainly ornamental. Um, there's one that was my favorite because it said, um, where was it? Truly untended hair implies that the wearer is desperate or insane and furthermore has no friends. Go off queen, don't hold back. Um, but a year later, someone wrote this response, Nicolo um, Calderaro there, and basically said, hey, guys, there's a problem with your hypothesis about long hair being special to humans. Not all humans have long hair that grows to their knees. Some people's hair grows upwards and not downwards. So this is all just to say there's a lot of armchair theorizing and a lot of thinking of hair as something that's ornamental. It's decorative. Like, what else could it possibly do? So I was very surprised that I wasn't seeing a lot about thermoregulation because when you're looking at other mammals, hair and thermoregulation goes hand in hand. Now, how is this relevant to humans? Because we know that humans evolved in equatorial Africa, we know that the evolutionary environment that would have shaped our ancestors would have been one of high solar radiation. That's in line with what we know about skin color, right? Once humans lost their body hair, their skin was the last barrier between them and the sun. So UV radiation can be very damaging and melanin protects you from UV um, radiation. But another fun fact, UV radiation is actually only a super small proportion of all solar radiation. Um, a large proportion of solar radiation supplies our planet with thermal radiation, so heat. That's why one of the many reasons thermal regulation is of concern. So little um, brief refresher on thermal regulation. It's how organisms keep their bodies within a range of temperatures where they can function. For humans, body temperature needs to remain between 35 degrees Celsius and 42 degrees Celsius. So what did early humans do? Well, they basically traded in some of those really developed hair follicles for better developed sweat glands. We are really, really good at sweating. It is actually the main tool that we have for bringing our body temperature down. But what if we weren't just reactive? What if there was something else we could do to protect our brains specifically? Most mammals have fur, even in the savanna, even where there is a lot of solar radiation because it offers protection from the sun. If you have a coat of hair, some of that radiation ends up being reflected and even absorbed by the hair before it reaches the skin. So with this context, I wanna introduce you to the work of Peter Wheeler. He did a lot of work in the 80s on thermal regulation and human evolution especially as it relates to bipedalism. And one of the things that he discussed in his papers was the potential role for scalp hair in protecting humans from solar radiation. As bipeds, we get the brunt of solar radiation on our heads. That's the issue with one of many issues walking upright. So Wheeler looked at the intensity of solar radiation throughout the day, noting that uh, hair only covers about 10% of our skin. So that might not seem like a lot, but once you take into consideration um, the angle of the sun to calculate the percentage of skin that is shielded when it's um, most sunny in the day, it's actually much more impressive and it's about 40% that is shielded when the sun is at its highest elevation. So in 2014, my uh, former advisor, Nina Jablonski, and George Chaplin took this hypothesis one step further by arguing that tightly curled hair, as seen in many African populations, might have some additional or superior protection that it's offering in terms of solar radiation. But because of the racist misconception that African hair is woolly, there are a lot of misguided ideas about tightly curled hair being insulating. So people haven't really been thinking about this. Actually, tightly coiled human hair is nothing like densely packed wool, which is crimped. Um, it's coiled, and that means that there's a lot of empty air space. And so you're able to 
maximize the distance between the scalp and the top of the hair without having a lot of densely packed hair, which is excellent if you want to reflect and absorb as much of that solar radiation before it hits the scalp. So I uh, decided I was gonna test this out and I got a bunch of wigs from the internet. Straight one, a slightly curled one, and a very curly one. And um, I can tell you more about like the exact origins of these hair samples. It was just really fun getting to buy lace front wigs for science. Um, we made sure that we had this range of curvature represented so that we could see if there was a pattern in a particular direction when it came to how they responded to solar radiation. Now to actually test the heat transfer properties of the wigs with different textures, I used something that's called a thermal mannequin. It's basically a human-shaped robot um, that measures heat loss. And it's often used in um, climate-controlled chambers to test the insulation value of clothing. And I just think it's really fun that their um, electric supply goes through their eye sockets. I feel like that's a really fun design choice that they have, but that's a side note. Um, the way that it works is you set a particular temperature to the surface of the thermal mannequin. And if a piece of clothing is very insulating or is not very insulating, then it will require more energy to keep that surface temperature, right? If a piece of clothing is very insulating, it will require less energy to keep that surface temperature. So that's how you're able to measure how insulating a piece of clothing is. And I guess we could do that for hair too. So the variables that we looked at were our human hair wigs. And of course, we had to have the bald head for reference. We simulated solar radiation with some floodlights, and we looked at wind speed to simulate the effect of standing still, walking, and running. And then finally, we um, looked at the scalp dry, but also uh, soaked wet to simulate um, evaporation from sweat. So I'm gonna summarize the most important result in a few figures. To briefly orient everyone, the different colors here represent um, different head coverings. So that's that nude, low curvature, mid curvature, and high curve, very curly. And what you see here is above zero means that you have heat loss. Below zero means that you have heat gain. That's bad, we want heat loss. So when we ran our experiments with simula without simulated solar radiation, we found that having no hair seemed to be the clear winner. In the absence of solar radiation, having no hair means you're losing the most heat, very clear. In the wet condition, so when you take into account evaporation, that's even further exaggerated. Just you can evaporate way more, you can lose way more heat if you have no barriers on your scalp. So that increase with wind speed that you see on the x-axis is something that you expect. The more, convec the more convection there is, the more you can evaporate. Now, what we're really interested in is what the results are with solar radiation. So when we looked at um, the results there, at first it might make you panic because it's almost all in the red zone, right? And that's correct. It's showing that when there is solar radiation, if you have no hair on your scalp, you are overheating like crazy. Um, and in fact, the only group that is at um, heat neutral, thermally neutral is tightly curled hair, even like kind of edging into heat loss as we go, get into the higher wind speeds. So what happens when we look at the wet results? The pattern is reversed again. So wait, does this actually mean that curly hair isn't useful? Well, let me put it together a little bit more um, complicated. So yes, Having curly hair or having any hair at all is a barrier that is gonna stop you from evaporating your sweat. But sweat is not an unlimited resource. You have a certain amount of it, you're gonna lose hydration, you're gonna lose electrolytes. And one of the things that you wanna think about is how much sweat you can have and how much sweat you need. So when we calculated the maximum potential for sweating, we saw again, Having a bald head is the best if you wanna get your sweat on. However, if you take into account that people only need to start sweating once they are gaining heat as a way to lose heat, then you see 
that that bald head really needs to sweat. It needs to sweat a lot to get back to thermal neutral. And when it comes to tightly curled hair, you don't even need to sweat because you have this amazing passive parasol on your head and you can just chill. So to sum it all up, our results show that hair minimizes heat gain, specifically from solar radiation, and that if you have no hair on the scalp versus having hair, that is already evident. But what is especially interesting and is really the contribution here is that the increase in hair curvature is associated with a decrease in solar heat gain and a decreased need for sweating. And after much strife, this was finally published last year. <sighs> Love that. So um, in terms of why I think we should think about phenotyping to reframe human hair evolution, typologies affect our perception. Um, I think this is especially evident in an example from the early 50s. <sighs> Until the 50s and even later, there were people who thought it was weird that Negroes had black skin when they lived in such sunny climates. Why is that? Well, because they considered black skin to be a proven disadvantage because it absorbed more radiation than white skin. After all, do black objects not heat up in the sun? What's more is they concluded that it was very hard to demonstrate any advantage to increase melanin content, but it was a little bit weird that you seem to have this pattern of darker skin where it was really sunny. I just can imagine these like British colonial dudes literally turning into lobsters as the people who are indigenous to those lands are not overheating with their black skin. That's a lot of confidence. And honestly, in a way I admire that. Now, while this seems silly now, not too long ago, this was taken seriously. Moving from skin color as described to objectively measured pigmentation hasn't just allowed us to appreciate the range of variation across human populations, but it's revealed patterns that help us form and test hypotheses of evolutionary function. And I think curvature moves us away from a significant misnomer of woolly hair which again shows this association with certain hair types and races. So this is actually, factually, a medical condition, allegedly, uh, that is defined as, in the non-black races, woolly hair is an uncommon anomaly of the hair structure. Tightly curled hair is not wool. I rest my case. There is an importance of measuring over classifying because if you are categorizing things, you end up creating a range of variation that might actually be expanded. Here you see that when you compare categorical hair types on the x-axis with actually objectively measured hair curvature. When you do that, you see that there's actually a huge range of variation in African populations and that the range of variation in Europeans is not that wide. So to summarize, instead of classifying, we should be measuring. And instead of focusing just on Europeans and Asians, let's look at Africans and Melanesians. Let's consider hair as not just ornamental, but think about it as something functional as that is how we look at it in many other mammals. Um, and that's it for me, just uh, here to thank the collaborators. Thank you. Ooh, happy to take questions, but... Now you have a voice. So some of the students may have to leave just so you know. Thank you. Very, very uh, interesting. You said the paper was published here after much strike. Would you care to elaborate? It might be informative. Oh, yes, sir. I mean, honestly, that strike was regular PhD strife, um, a regular collaborator strife of what is enough to include in a paper. It wasn't even the reviewers. We were the problem. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, I was the problem here. <laughs> hmm? Just a clarification. The medical condition, wooly hair, were you saying it's different from tightly curled hair? Or um, what? Or is it, is it a, a, the same genetics maybe that so that's a great question. What I'm saying is that woolly hair is actually 
uh, a made up condition, by which I mean woolly hair syndrome being defined as the presence of tightly curled hair in non-black people okay. is not like medically informative, but there are a number, number of conditions like this in medicine. It might be genetically interesting though. It might be genetically interesting in the sense that maybe they are noticing, they're, maybe they're gonna be able to find associations with uh, hair morphology in particular genes, yeah. but I think medicalizing it doesn't make it useful. Okay. But yeah, like I absolutely, like I'm definitely thinking about Mendelian conditions that influence hair, uh, teeth, and nails, just as anything that's keratin uh, related in terms of the pathway. This is a little bit off in left field, but since you're an expert on hair, I would appreciate it if you would weigh in on the whole head louse, body louse, Mark Stone King, and is that still valid? Because I love to teach that. <laughs> um, honestly, I have to check up again, because like last time that I looked, it was just really weird in that my understanding was the lice that chimps have are more closely related to our head lice, but the lice that gorillas have are more closely related to our pubic lice. Well, I think that's, that's weird. What, okay. I, I remember it was really weird and people came up with all kinds of weird fan fiction, but I don't know if, well, so like, I guess the, the question then is like, at what point did they hop over and was, were, were there two separate events in which they I mean, people over? may not know what I'm alluding to, um, so if you're gonna talk about it, maybe you wanna tell oh, people. Okay. Well, so I was just gonna say there's this like, similarity in phylogeny between lice that you find in gorillas and chimps and in human head hair versus pubic hair because it's two different types of lice. Is that the context? Yeah, it, I mean partly that and that you can use when people uh, started to wear clothing, you can deduce whole part piece about deducing when people started to wear clothing, which they could only have done um, when there were, it wasn't, they, they had to provide a home for the body. So when the head lice diverged from the body lice, mm -hmm. phylogenetically is when people started to wear clothing. I heard of that hypothesis. I wasn't sure that they were really confident about it because like what counts as clothing and if it's something like you're wearing furs then that's hair itself so i don't know i mean it's really difficult to time that also because i think when it comes to parasite evolution there's a lot of assumptions about when those parasites hopped onto humans and if they're not exclusive to humans i don't know are they are human body lice and head lice exclusive to humans Yes, yes, it's a species that's human. It has human in the uh, species name. The idea being that we would have only had one kind of louse, mm. and then we started to have two kinds of lice, mm. and that's because the body lice had diverged from the head lice because they were hanging out somewhere in clothing, presumably, that they couldn't have just grabbed onto naked skin and anyway, if it's not yeah. something you're really thinking yeah. about a lot. I, I mean, it's something I wanted to revisit, but then there's still the question of the, what's going on with gorillas and pubic lice, right? Like when you have that third type. And also because clothing is like so variable, it's like depending on what material you're using, but I have to read more into it. Okay, okay. That's thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you find any other like interesting associations with like hair curvature and other things? Like for example, Maybe there was an association between hair curvature and sex? Ah, uh, I see what you're saying. So our sample was not big enough to look at sex differences. There's another sample that I'm looking at right now where we were looking at cross-sectional size and in our European subsample, there seems to be a difference where European males seem to have thicker hair than European females. We didn't see that in other samples. It could also just be because our sample size wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you know anything about like the adaptive significance of um, balding, especially because it happens like, or it can happen well before you other body parts begin to senesce, especially in males mm -hmm. in like the teens and twenties. Mm -hmm. Great question. 
uh, inevitably, there comes a time uh, at the end of every talk that I give like this where I'm asked about balding, and I have to say that um, evolution doesn't care about you post-reproductively, but you bring up the fact that it does occur sometimes in individuals who can't necessarily be considered to be post-reproductive yet. Um, if it is not a high number of people in which that pathological trait occurs, you can't really consider, well, you can assume that it probably didn't have a lot of effect on selection. So if it's just like, you know, every now and then we see some people who have that nowadays, it doesn't necessarily tell us about any kind of uh, distribution of the trait in the past. So it could have been that this is something that just started occurring now because of novel mutations or new environmental reasons why hormones are interacting with people's scalp hair in a way that causes baldness earlier. But I think that if you're looking across most human populations, this isn't a trait that occurs until later age mostly. And so I don't think that it's the result of selection. I think that any baldness that we see nowadays, even in people who are younger, is just genetic drift, something that just occurred in the absence of selection. Mm -hmm. Are there genes that we can look at that show like links between the human like scalp hair and body hair? And then, do you have any ideas of or is anyone looking into like um, like the functional significance of variation within body hair? How some people have more of it than others, or if, like even even the morphology of like uh, body hair in different areas? Great question. There's a number of things there. So. Um, First of all, absolutely am very interested in looking at variation within individuals because um, I think one of the coolest things about biology is that you can take the same genome and it'll do different things in different cells. So it's like, why do you know that my eyebrow hair is supposed to be this short? And why do you forget once I become an emeritus professor? Um, so you can learn a lot about gene expression. And once you know about gene expression, like what's the difference between the genes expressed here and there, you know which genes are um, important. Or honestly, it'll probably be a, a bunch of, um, what do you call it? Um, not the actual protein coding genes themselves, but gene regulators. Um, what was the first part of your question? Like the, the significance of variation in like body hair morphology? Mm -hmm. um, so evolutionary significance? I don't know about evolutionary <laughs> significance, and also I don't know about genes that will tell us about both, right? I, I, I really am looking for the, what is the hairlessness gene? Like what's going on there? Um, I think it'll be something regulatory, and it may not necessarily be related to hair specifically, by which I mean it might be something that regulates the patterning of gene expression. So if you think about uh, lions, and if you think about, um, what are they called? Horses. They have like, you know, super long hair on just like, you know, one place. So is there maybe something early on that gets patterned in a way that it that it says, okay, here, here, if you see this, then grow long. Um, and I, I, I don't really know where to start looking for that, and I don't even know how people will start looking at um, gene, spatially regulated uh, gene expression, but there are people with mice who uh, I want to collaborate with who may be able to help me answer that question. Do you think that sexual selection could explain why women tend to have less body hair than men? I'm a big skeptic of sexual selection, especially as far as like mate selection goes. I think that there's a lot of spandrels when it comes to sex differences. Um, I think that there are going to be things that are expressed variably that manifest differently depending on the physiological background upon which it's being expressed. And so women having less body hair, I don't think is necessarily something that was selected for so much as something that is a side effect of other things that might have been selected for, like maybe body fat. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's a, it doesn't want it to be fur, but does anyone measure scalps and looks at how the follicles and everything is lined up underneath? So, so like in terms of the distance between follicles? Distance and if it's shape or other things that are... Um, and do you mean specifically in the context of compared to animal fur? Oh, well, even compared to these human differences, oh. the curvature, the thickness, uh, that. 
Um, so there are, like, dermatologists are really interested in that, like the, the, the number of follicles per whatever square centimeter. Um, and there are some reported differences, but it, again, just the way that dermatologists and just in general, some medical disciplines do their sampling, I'm a little bit cautious to interpret them saying that there's a difference between here, our sample of French Guianians and French people. Like, I, I don't really know what to make of it, but there have been reported differences in hair density across populations. And I'm definitely interested in that. Okay. All right, thank you so much. We have a faculty meeting to go to, some of us. Yeah. <laughs>